great to be with you again. For those of you who don't know me, I grew up near the Gulf Coast, and that may be why I love the beach so much. It's one of my favorite places. I could spend all day on the sand, reading a book under an umbrella, walking along the shore, listening to the waves. But you know, by about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, I'm pretty done. I feel hot, tired, and dirty. By then, I have gritty sand all over my body. It's between my toes, it's under my swimsuit, it's down in my hair. I can hardly wait to shower. You know, there's nothing quite like a shower after a day at the beach to make me feel really, really clean. But you know, there's a greater clean that Jesus gives. And it's not just sand, it's something far dirtier than sand. It's from our sins. And so how do we get clean from our sins? We're going to look at two aspects of that today from our two Psalms. First, we're going to look at that one-time cleansing that Jesus gives that we call salvation. We're also going to look at the ongoing cleansing that comes as we walk with Jesus and confess our sins. So first, we're going to look at Psalm 22. You might want to open your Bible to it. It's a Davidic psalm, as you saw in your lesson. It's a lament or a complaint. And David wrote it to express the feelings that he had when he was attacked without cause. But from our understanding today, we understand that David actually, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, describes what happened to Jesus on the cross. And we know from Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, David was a prophet. And just like other prophets, he didn't necessarily understand what he was writing. It's only as the, these prophecies are fulfilled that we can see there was far broader and greater meaning. This psalm would be called a messianic psalm because it points to Jesus as the Messiah. And we see Jesus quote this psalm from the cross. In David's case, he used hyperbole, and that's just a poetic device that you use, particularly for a psalm of complaint, where you've got this sense of disorientation. You always had confidence in God, as we saw from our psalms of confidence. You had this faith, you had this confidence, but somehow he doesn't seem to be coming true, through. Somehow things don't seem right, and so that is expressed through hyperbole. Brueggemann says this about the use of hyperbole in the Psalms of Complaint. He said, It is the work of such speech to give shape, power, visibility, authenticity to the experience of disorientation. So he's describing his feelings, but when Jesus fulfilled them, it actually described what physically happened to him on the cross centuries before there was any crucifixion. This is what happened to Jesus. David's words were ultimately fulfilled when Jesus, who was totally innocent, he was God come to earth, he had never experienced sin. Sin was laid on him on the cross. Charles Spurgeon describes Psalm 22 this way. He says, Beyond all others, the Psalm of the Cross it is the photograph of our Lord's saddest hours, the record of his dying words, the lacamatory, which means container of his last tears, the memorial of his expiring joys. So I'm going to go through Psalm 22. I'm not going to read every verse, but I'm going to highlight the verses that talk about Jesus' suffering. And I want you, as I read, to really just meditate on what happened to Jesus on the cross. Think about it. You might even want to close your eyes if that helps you to better focus. Um, it is not just a poem or a song. It is actually the reflection of the actual physical and emotional experiences of the Son of God as he died a horrible death for you and me. So Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. 
verses 6 to 8. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Verses 11 to 18. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot surge, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evil doers encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. To even better understand the depth of Jesus' suffering, I think it's good to look at 2 Corinthians 5 2. This is what it says For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, the perfect holy God, was made sin for us. He took the weight and the guilt of the sins of the whole world onto his own body so that we might be reconciled to God, so he might cleanse us from our sins. You know, I've done things that I look back on, particularly things I've said to people that were either just flat not nice or maybe um, not particularly sympathetic or understanding of people um, that have hurt and really been wrongly said about people made in God's image. And when I come to recognize that I've said something like that, it just really gr grieves me and I feel the weight of that sin on me. And when I think about that, I can't even imagine how Jesus must have felt with the weight of all the sins of the world, yours, mine, and everyone else's on him. When he was totally innocent, he never had felt sin in his life and it was all placed on him. That were, this whole psalm reminds me of the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us by Stuart Townsend. Listen to the verses of the first four stanzas. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which mark the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. So how do we get clean from the dirt of our sins? Through Jesus' one-time death for us, bringing us salvation. We've just read a description of what that death was like. That was for us. That was for our sins. The scripture says that Jesus perfected us on the cross. Hebrews 10, 12 to 14 says, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. We receive that one-time cleansing when we trust in Jesus, when we know that he is God himself who came to earth and chose to die on the cross. He sacrificed himself and he washed all our sins away when we believe in him and turn to follow him. But second, as we follow Jesus, we continue confessing and repenting of our sins. And his cleansing results in continued fellowship with God. When we initially follow Jesus, we recognize that our sins separate us from God. Our salvation results in understanding that. We understand that that has happened. And our sin, um, involves not only our evil thoughts and our evil deeds, 
It also involves the things that we don't do that we should do, the positive things that we fail to do for others. And it also involves the fact that we don't worship God alone. We don't put him first. So inherent in salvation is a sense of, sense of lament over our sins and a desire to walk with God and be different people. But there's also an ongoing call for those who already believe to confess and repent. And that restores that fellowship with God when we walk away from him, when we ignore him. Um, we're to live out the gospel and sin prevents us from doing that. Um, it prevents us from becoming more like Jesus. If we don't confess it, we don't become more like Jesus. We call that sanctification. We're not being sanctified if we're going our own way and not listening to what God is telling us about our sins. You know, sometimes I think in our concern that Christians don't feel that weight and the guilt of sin, we tend to gloss over the need to recognize our sins and confess. Uh, we, we hurried that process because we don't want people to feel guilty or sad, but conviction is from the Spirit, and it purposes to lead us to grief of our sins and repentance. 2 Corinthians seven ten says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. I read this quote describing somebody who experiences godly grief. It says, this is someone who is, quote, mourning for sin because it has displeased God, who is so dear and so sweet a father to us. Godly grief comes as the Spirit works in our lives and convicts us of sin. When we're truly sorry, when we truly realize this is a sin that put Jesus on the cross, this is sin, sin is, is not just something we deal with lightly. It is something that we need to be uh, concerned about. Um, so whatever we've done to others, however we've harmed them, whatever we've done um, in our hearts, godly grief leads to a 180 degree turn, and that's what repentance is. And we see that in Psalm 81, so uh, 51, not 81. So that's our second psalm for the day. We see this kind of confession and repentance in David's confession in Psalm 51. You know, in other psalms of complaint, the psalmist complains about his circumstances. He cries out to God, God, why aren't you fixing this? But in this psalm, God, David cries out to God also, but his complaint is about his own sin. It's not about other sin. He basically complains about himself and then begs for God's mercy. So let's look at the elements of his confession. On what basis does he act for forgiveness? And first we see on the basis of God's character. In verse 1, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your loyal love. Because of your great compassion, wash away my rebellious acts. Verse 14, Rescue me from the guilt of murder, O God, the God who delivers me. Then my tongue will shout for joy because of your righteousness. So David doesn't plead his goodness or excuse himself in any way. He says, The only way I can be forgiven is because you are a merciful God. You are a righteous God. You are a compassionate God and you have loyal love for me. So what exactly does David then confess? He, he confesses on the basis of God's character, but what does he confess? And I'm going to go through the verses where he talks about that. Verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your loyal love, because of your great compassion, wash away my rebellious acts. The Hebrew word there is translated often transgression, which is a willful deviation from our defiance of God. Verse 2, wash away my wrongdoing. This word is often translated iniquity, which is a deviation from the right path. You, I've started going down the wrong path. Cleanse me of my sin, and this word means missing the mark. Sin is multifaceted. The Bible doesn't just use the word sin. It uses multiple words for sin that we need to be aware of because often we don't understand that in the English. Verse 3, for I'm aware, aware of my rebellious acts. I'm forever conscious of my sin. Against you, you above all I have sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. Here he says, it's what is evil? So that you're just when you confront me. You're right when you condemn me. He acknowledges that God is very uh, just 
to condemn him for this because it was wrong. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be pure. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. He recognizing he needs God's cleansing to get rid of his sin. Verse 8, grant me the ultimate joy of being forgiven. May the bones you crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away my guilt. Look at verses uh, 10 to 12. Create for me a pure heart, O God. Renew a resolute spirit within me. Do not reject me. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Let me again experience the joy of your deliverance. Sustain me by giving me the desire to obey. And God doesn't take the Holy Spirit away from us as Christians, but David had a special anointing of the Spirit to be the king, which God took away from Saul. So David did not want God's anointing to be taken from him. Verse 14, Rescue me from the guilt of murder, O God, the God who delivers me. Then my tongue will shout for joy because of your righteousness. He specifies here the sin of murder. But he also asked God for a heart change. It's not just enough to wash away what he's done. He wants a heart change. He doesn't ever want to go there again. He doesn't ever want to do this kind of sin against God again. And he can have joy when that happens. Verse 15, O Lord, give me the words, then my mouth will praise you. Certainly you do not want a sacrifice or else I would offer it. You do not desire a burnt sacrifice. The sacrifice God desires is a humble heart. O oh God, a humble and repentant heart you will not reject. In these verses, David really gets to the root of confession, which is a heart attitude. We can't be forgiven because of the things that we do to try to fix it. We need the heart attitude of humility and of repentance toward God. Being sorry that you got caught is not repentance. Repentance is a desire to change. 1 John 1, 8 to 10 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The tense of the word confess is a present tense. This is something we're supposed to be doing throughout our Christian lives. It's an ongoing process. Godly grief leads us to confess and repent, and that's what John is talking about here. But he says that he also cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That means when we have a repentant heart, when we desire to be clean before God, he not only cleanses us from those sins we confess, but from other sins that we aren't even aware of. And so we're restored in our relationship with God. God, God wants us to learn from our sins, and the only way to do that is to confess them, not be weighed down by them. So once we confess them, we're no longer weighed down by those sins, but we can still learn from them. Jesus fully paid for our sins. He's ready to restore us to fellowship as we confess, as David did, honestly, specifically, humbly, and with a repentant heart that comes from godly sorrow. I often see two unhealthy extremes that Christians have about their sins. First, focusing on forgiveness without confession. Well, I'm forgiven. And basically they dismiss the weight and the uh, consequences of sin. We need to recognize the horror of the sin that we have done and that Jesus had to die a horrible death because of those sins. And to do that, we have to keep looking inward at our hearts. What's going on in our hearts? What do we need to confess? And when we, once we do confess, we have that joy uh, and, and blessing of forgiveness, of feeling that cleansing that Jesus gives us. The second problem for Christians is focusing on our sins instead of God's forgiveness. It's feeling like I just can't ever be forgiving. I can't go forward with God. God can't use me because I've done these things. When we do that, we're living with shame and grief, which, which God takes away uh, through Jesus' death, and we're, we're not useful to God. So instead of either one of those extremes, the thing to do is to consistently confess and repent and then believe that God does forgive. When we keep those sins on ourselves and don't focus on forgiveness, we're saying, I don't really believe you've forgiven me, God. We're expressing that we don't trust God to do what he said. In Hebrews 10, 19 to 22, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, 
by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He invites us, draw near. You've sinned, but draw near. Come near me, I have washed you clean. If Jesus has never given you a shower to wash away your sins, look to him today. He wants to cleanse you. He is God who came to earth and died for you. And he invites you to come. He invites you to come and follow him. If you're a Christian who skips confession, I suggest that you make it a daily routine, a daily part of your prayers, that you look within and say, what have I done that is not like God? How have I been unlike God today? What thoughts, what deeds, or what things have I left undone that God would have done today? Because God, Jesus wants to wash those away too. He wants to wash those feelings of guilt and shame away from you in an ongoing way. That's the way of sanctification if you want to grow to be more like Jesus. Or if you as a Christian continue living with shame and guilt and feel like you cannot serve God, you cannot be honest about who you are, that you're still living under the guilt of your sins, you need to believe that Jesus has totally cleansed you and he wants you to move forward. There may, may be bad consequences from those sins that aren't going to go away, but that doesn't mean that you aren't clean and that you can't move forward with him. You need to trust him. Let's enjoy salvation through the cleansing power of salvation and the ongoing cleansing of confession and repentance. And we can be healed, we can be cleansed from those sins. I want to end with Psalm 32, verses 1 to 5, and it's from David also. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the cleansing power of the crucifixion. Thank you for Jesus' sacrifice for us. Let us never take it lightly. Let us never take sin lightly. Continue to grow us by showing us our sin continue to call us to confession and repentance and fellowship with you. Help us to believe that we are totally cleansed and to walk in new hearts that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen.